Welcome and thank you for joining us for this Chamber to Community Back to Business NWA series. For those of you joining us for the first time, I'm Karen Wagaman, Vice President of Downtown Development for the Rogers Lowell Area Chamber of Commerce. This virtual series was created as a response to businesses looking for tools and tactics to navigate through COVID-19 and all the challenges that we've been facing. Today's topic is navigating 2021, the economy, the stimulus, and COVID-19. This session is being recorded and will be added to the C2C playlist on the Chamber's YouTube channel. So I will send you a link once we have it uploaded and you may watch it again or share it with friends and associates. Now I would like to thank our sponsors. Our community builder sponsor is Black Hills Energy. Our signage sponsor is Printova Signs. And of course our presenter, Rankin Consulting, Leadership Consulting and Organizational Design. So we would like to welcome our presenter, Dr. David F. Rankin. Dr. Rankin is economist, author, and economic advisor in Arkansas. He is the author of What Every American Needs to Know About Economics. Dr. Rankin is President Emeritus at Southern Arkansas University, where he's been a professor in finance and economics for over 46 years and served as president for 13 years. He has served as the economic advisor to Arkansas governor since 1976 and is currently chairman of Asa Hutchinson's Governor's Council for Economic Advisors. He is a George Washington Honor Medal recipient from the Freedoms Foundation for Excellence in Economic Education. He currently serves as our chair of the Golden Triangle Economic Development Council and for the past 24 years he has been the chairman of the Governor's Council of Economic Advisors a position which was appointed by then Governor Mike Huckabee in 1996. Dr. Rankin also served on the NCAA Division II National Presidents Council and NCAA Long Range Planning Task Force. He's married to Tony and they have three children, Curtis, Beth Ann, and John. And speaking of his family, also joining us today for this workshop is the other Dr. Rankin, Dr. Beth Ann Rankin, Dr. Rankin's daughter, just completed her doctorate in leadership and learning in organizations from Vanderbilt. She's the owner of Rankin Consulting, and we are glad to have both of them here today. So Dr. Rankin, we are going to turn this over to you, and we're excited to take this compelling look at the pandemic and the stimulus and the economy as you chart your path for 2021 and help us chart, chart ours as well. So Dr. Rankin, we will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Karen, and it's a pleasure. Rogers Lowell Chamber of Commerce, pleasure to be involved in this series. I've looked at several of the programs and they're excellent and you're doing a great job here. It's a pleasure to join you by Zoom as Bob Dylan sang back in the 60s, times they are a changing, one of my favorite songs. And by the way, the pandemic canceled my trip to the Dylan concert in Little Rock. I was gonna go see Bob Dylan in June and all of that went away when the pandemic hit us. Today, we're gonna to look at the 2020 virus, which obviously is going into 2021, and look at the economic impact and the economic crisis that it helped create. And then we're gonna do a little fortune telling, hopefully for 2021. 2020 has been a lot like the opening sentence from Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. I think most of you know it well. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And this was London and Paris in the 18th century. And of course we had that in 2020, January, February, we were skating along, unemployment was low, inflation was low, interest rates were low, economic growth was good, everything was wonderful. And then wham, we got hit by the pandemic and everything just went down the tubes. It was something else. The national corona fight has created the biggest and quickest economic dislocation in our history, and certainly something that is only rivaled by the Great Depression back in, in the 1930s. Just a little bit of history on the Great Depression, just to give us a context. One third of all the banks failed, and some of you may have driven through towns and seen banks that are no longer bank buildings, that are no longer banks, but they have the name up there in, in con etched in concrete. Many of these failed. The unemployment rate went to 25%. The money supply, imagine this, the money supply declined by one third, 33%. 
Now, during the Great Depression, if you had cash under the in the mattress, you were in great shape. And I knew of people who had cash. They had just saved a lot of cash. Oh, they were able to buy diamond rings, mules, farms, whatever they could, they, cars, automobiles, because they were all on sale uh, at bargain basement prices. Much of the country actually went back to the barter system. And if you were a medical doctor in that day, you might have been paid in uh, chickens or somebody caught some fish out, out at the lake or maybe paid with some beef. It was back to the barter system. The problem was Federal Reserve System set up in 1913 to prevent just such an event. They allowed it to happen. They kind of stood by and let all these banks fail. I always tell my students in class, Never let your banks fail, ever, 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 ever. The depression lasted 10 years and it was only World War II that put 12 million in the military and everybody else in a defense plant that pulled us out of the Great Depression. So it can happen and that was a long one and it happened. Let's think about what happened in 2020 along about March. Unemployment rate was three and a half percent and by April it was 14.7%. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was down by 38%. All prices even went into negative territory. Can you imagine? Went to negative. K through 12 schools and colleges and universities shut their doors. Everybody went home. Some states declared almost a virtual total lockdown. All economic activity ceased. J.C. Penney declared bankruptcy. What could be worse? Many governors locked down their cities, some mayors and governors locked down their cities, locked down their, their total states, and off we were running. Consumer Prod's confidence index dropped to 86% from 132 just a month before. So everybody was depressed. It was a terrible situation. Ladies and gentlemen, we're headed for the second Great Depression at this point. If something hadn't been done to put the brakes on this, we'd have gone right on down the tubes. It's important to understand that this economic calamity was self-induced. We did this to ourselves. And there's no question that the idea of, of making some changes in lifestyle and all of that, but we were talking about shutting down an economy. Elon Musk, <clears throat> I really like the comments that he makes. And Elon Musk said back in May of 2020, he said, if you don't make stuff, there is no stuff. And this is a reminder that if you don't have people going to work every day and producing things, you're not going to have th anything and you're not even going to have a health care system. If you shut down, you don't have any stuff. <clears throat> In addition to that, we found out lockdowns don't work. Sweden didn't do it. Europe did it. And then we look at the U.S. <clears throat> if lockdowns work, why didn't it work back in April and May? It didn't work. And so I think a lot of that economic damage was really kind of senseless. Let's look at Arkansas. Here we are in January. I want to look at the numbers in Arkansas so you can have a kind of an idea. 284,000 cases, that's 9.5% of our population of uh, right at 3 million. We've had uh, deaths uh, and 4,650 deaths, which is 15 one hundredths of 1%. So as serious as this is, we have to keep it in perspective. 15 one hundredths of 1% 1 of our population. Uh, that's, that's how deadly it is. The US, if you look at those numbers, 25 million cases, 7.6% of the population. But again, only 13 one hundredths of 1% 1 because we have a population of 331 million. So let's keep that in perspective. Let's look at Arkansas in terms of the vaccines. I just want to bring these numbers. These are the latest numbers we have. We've received 337,000 doses in the state of Arkansas. We've given out 214,000. If you just calculate the number on that, it's a little over 60% in terms of the actual administration. But I know it's ramped up. In the United States, we've had 40 million doses delivered and we've had 21 million administered. So kind of give us an idea. We have we're, we need to ramp it up even more, but each state is doing it by themselves, and I think they will get it right. Back to March of 2020, it was obvious by March we were really in trouble, and something had to be done and done quickly, and this is where the CARES Act came in. 
That's the Corona Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act that uh, was passed in March of 27. And I, it was quick action. That's what I love about it. It was quick action. We didn't delay. We took quick action, which was the key to our recovery. I'll just run through some of the numbers. 2.2 trillion, 669 billion for paycheck protection, that's small business. $1,200 payment to individual taxpayers. $260 billion in extra unemployment benefits. And this was the extra $600 per week. Initially, I thought, man, that, that's going to encourage people not to work. But this was a, this was a direct payment. See, the $1,200, that was directly to the, the citizens. The Paycheck Protection Program was directly to small business. And the $260 billion in extra unemployment benefits was directly to people who had been unemployed. We also had billions to, for states, airports, various critical structures. Arkansas airports got 51 billion. I noticed that Rogers Executive up near you, uh, a little bit smaller airport, we've got 157,000. Northwest Arkansas airport got 8,217,000. Colleges and universities got 14 billion. K through 12 got 13 billion. So a lot of money was spread out into the economy and went directly. It didn't go to a big program and have it filter down. It went direct and that was key. It's worth noting that we were projecting a $1 trillion deficit for 2020, fiscal year 2020 ended September the 30th, uh, 1 trillion. It ended up being 3.7 trillion, largely because of the stimulus. It could be even higher next year, depending on the size of the proposed stimulus coming out of the Biden administration. Where'd all this money come from? <clears throat> Basically, the Federal Reserve created, the Federal Reserve System created. It bought bonds from the United States Treasury, put it in its, its asset accounts, and provided a checking account for the United States Treasury to spend it. We're basically monetizing our own debt. We're both the borrower and the lender. Now, if this gets out of hand, which it has in other, some other countries, it can be a really, really bad dose of medicine. Now, Arkansas cannot do that. We, are, we have the Revenue Stabilization Act from back in the 40s. Thankfully, we can't do it. We cannot borrow money and use that money for operating expenses. The federal government can, the treasury can. Currently our total production is about, gross domestic product about $22 trillion. Our debt now is, and rising is about 27 trillion. And the question is, are we in financial trouble yet? The answer is no, <clears throat> but obviously we are moving in that direction because What's happening is our debt is rising as a percentage of a gross domestic product. You'd like for at least to stay about the same level, but now it's beginning to rise. We have not gotten to the point we're in trouble. Japan has got 250% debt to their gross domestic product, and they're still, still surviving. They're not doing that great, but they're still surviving. We can continue, and basically what we're doing is printing money. We can continue to print money until inflation gets to be a problem. When that happens, we're gonna have a recession because the Federal Reserve will have to move to mute inflation. At this point, it's muted. Dr. Charles Venus, who has served with me for many years on the Governor's Council of Economic Advisors, <clears throat> he's one of the first gentlemen to teach uh, economics uh, on AETN <clears throat> years ago. He said, we're going broke. It's just gonna take a long time. And that's kind of where we are. <clears throat> Was the stimulus ill-advised? No. The government broke the economy. The government needed to fix it. Nobody else could fix it because the government breaks it. The private sector can't fix it because they're suffering from it. Governors were primarily responsible for the extension of it because we had a national, national shutdown basically in the spring but it didn't last that long, but many of the governors carried this right on. Fortunately, not our governor. He used common sense and he asked us to use common sense. Uh, most notably, we had a construction project going on at our church and it was not shut down. It went on, it would have been a disaster if it had been shut down. It went right on, everything was, was completed. Manufacturing in the state continued. 
And so we did not do that knee jerk reaction of locking everything down. We have a federal system, we call federalism, where the states have wide powers, which means some governors can do things that other governors might not think are wise. The shutdown reached into our economy and jerked out trillions. <clears throat> so somebody had to put trillions back and it was the federal government through the stimulus program. So the Federal Reserve System and the Treasury this time handled it much differently from the Great Depression. They realized it was a question of money and spending power and cash that had been jerked out. They had to put it back in. So they knew what needed to, do, needed to be done and they did it. It had to be direct and other words, going direct to the citizens and it had to be fast. We economists call this helicopter money because I always joke with my students, I said, rather than let a 10 year depression going on, we should have just loaded some military airplanes, got a bunch of cash and flown over the cities and dumped it out. The problem during the Great Depression wasn't a failure of capitalism or something like that. It was no money. There was no money. You have no money, you go back to the barter system, which is very, very inefficient. We may need a little bit more of this before this is over. Uh, I don't know how much exactly, but a little bit more. The Federal Reserve System has plenty of dry powder left. They can provide the treasury with whatever they need. We just have to be sure it does not get out of hand. Trump administration in December, the second follow on stimulus. I'll just run through a few of these things. Direct payments, uh, 600 small business help through payroll protections. Unemployment, an extra $300 a week down from 600, an extra six, 300. Vaccine distribution, 16 billion, entertainment venues, rental assistance, things of that nature. So <clears throat> I think it was needed. I think it was needed. The extra 600 billion was great. My son walked in the house the other day and held up his, his stimulus check and said, wow, this, this is a good thing because it puts purchasing power in the hands of, of people who are gonna spend it. Now I will say this, the people who have jobs <clears throat> and get these checks, probably going to save it, pay down debt. The people who don't have, have lost their jobs, they're going to, probably going to spend it pretty quick. Now, <clears throat> this one has just been passed. It hasn't even really gotten in the, the, the pipeline yet, but let's look what is proposed now with the new Biden administration. They're proposing a $1.9 trillion in addition so this gets us about uh, almost $3 trillion worth of additional $1,400 direct stimulus payments, which that'd be the 600 from Trump and the 1,400 from Biden, that would give you 2,000. I'll drop down, skip the minimum wage for a minute and say $400 a week, unemployment insurance, 116 billion vaccine distribution, which is an awful lot, 350 billion for state and local governments. Now, this was uh, part of the, uh, uh, efforts from some of the bigger cities like New York City and Chicago and San Francisco, these where those shut these cities down, well, your rev state revenue dries up. And when that happens, you need some help. And this is a, a big uh, part of the impetus to put in a lot of state and local government help for these areas. I'll go back to the minimum wage and let me just make a comment about the minimum wage. <clears throat> I'm not a proponent of the minimum wage at least not at the federal level. If it's gonna be done, it needs to be done at the state level. And here's the reason. We, if we have a $15, million minimum, $15 minimum wage in Arkansas, that's equivalent to a $30, really actually $33 minimum wage in New York City because of the difference in the cost of living. So if you could have a $33 minimum wage in New York, that would be on a par with a 15 in Arkansas. But if we put a 15 in Arkansas, we're a lower income state, but we're also a much lower cost of living state. That, that will disadvantage us more. That would be equivalent to having 33 in New York City. Well, they will have the 15, which is not that big a deal in New York City because of the cost of living and high, the high number of wages. Make one other comment. We always say, well, it's bad for business out to lay off employees. That's true, but what business generally does is look for capital. They'll say, well, I have 100 employees. I'm, it's going to raise my cost quite dramatically. I'll reduce to 75 employees and I'll in, in add capital, implement capital. And you can see this when you go to McDonald's and you walk in and you play with a little screen there and then you walk up and get your order. 
makes a difference. So this is not in the best interest of Arkansas for sure, and particularly other, not only low income, but lower cost states. Uh, it's very important that we watch that and be careful. What do we need to do now? All right, we need to get our economy completely open. That's number one. Number two, we need to distribute the vaccine to the right groups first. In fact, the vaccine will be the biggest stimulus that we can create. That's the biggest stimulus. It's not the dollars, but the vaccine. Who should get it first and who is getting it first to hopefully? Look who's in the hospital. Look at the demographic of who's in the hospital. Go out into the population and give these folks the shot. That's the way that needs to work. And I think we're coming around to that in most cases, that these are the ones who end up in the hospital. These are the ones we need to give the shot to. And that will then empty out our hospitals. And it, I think we'll be over barring any other big calamities. What about 2021? I wanna look forward to 2021 just a minute. That this could be a very good year. I hate to be too optimistic, but I'm a kind of an optimistic guy anyway, but I hate to be too optimistic, but 2021 looks like a really good year. Number one, we got the December stimulus. The, the stimulus back in, in, in March worked really well. Well, we added another trillion dollars in December and I'm sure the Biden administration is gonna wanna add some more in January, February, March. So that's a lot of, lot of impetus for economic activity. Janet Yellen's the new treasury secretary. We already know what Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Fed has said. He said, I'm gonna keep interest rates low and provide the money. Janet Yellen has come in and basically, if you look at her comments, she said, let's put the pedal to the metal. She's in favor of fiscal stimulus. She's in favor of monetary stimulus. So she wants to put more wood in the furnace. Now, this is going to make sure, barring some calamity, we can't see that 2021 is going to be a good year. What will this, all this do to inflation? I think it's going to increase the risk of inflation down the road, but not now. And of course, right now we're living in the now, here and now, we're trying to survive at this particular point. We can continue to produce and yet protect our popula vulnerable populations at the same time. The vaccine's a huge breakthrough. It's gonna make a tremendous difference. Now, in terms of economics and health, I love Thomas Sowell, Dr. Thomas Sowell with the Hoover Institute. And he frequently writes and shows up in the Arkansas Democrat. He said, and I've met him, he's brilliant. There are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. There are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. This is what we should have thought about back in March. This is a trade-off. We can't have the best of both worlds. We can't eliminate the health issue uh, without eliminating, destroying the economy. So there's got to be a trade-off. We really have to be careful about what we're doing. Now let's look at the survival rates. So these are from the CDC. They're really interesting. If you look at the survival rate for people who have COVID in these categories, look, look at the zero to 19. It's almost total survival, 20 to 49, almost total survival, 50 to 69, 5% death rate in that group, 70, even 70 plus, you're talking about 5.4%. So this is not a, a, a death warrant. And you have to understand, you look at the productive ages of most of our population is in the 69 and below. There's some 70 ab above, that is for sure but it's mainly in the 69 and below. 81% of all the deaths are over age 65. 92% of all the deaths are over age 55. And if you look at the below 24 age group, it's 0.19 of 1% of the deaths are in this area. Many of the deaths have pre-existing conditions. Now I'm gonna stick my neck out a little bit on this. But by March, at the rate we're vaccinating, which is about a million a day, we vaccinated 20 million Americans already, and we've just been in this a month. By the rate we're going, we should have approximately 100 million Americans vaccinated by the end of March. Hopefully, we'll have the over 65 group vaccinated by the end of March. 
I was listening to a medical expert the other day on uh, the news, and he said, we, we've, you know how many we've had, about 25 million that have been documented to have the virus. He said there may be 60 million who've actually had it. I tend to agree with this because I talked to someone yesterday. He said, I think I had it, but I didn't go to the doctor. I know of a lot of people in that case, they didn't get sick enough to go to the doctor or get tested and so forth, so they just didn't. But they probably had it. The below 24 age group is at little risk, and there's 110 million of these individuals. So you have 100 million vaccinated, you have the below 24 age, 110 million, then you have 60 million that may ought to have it. And I know there's some double counting in here, but you had 100 million, 60 million, and 110 million, and maybe take out some for double counting. You're starting to talk about uh, who's going to be left to go to the hospital particularly if we get the age 65 and over taken care of, we've knocked out 80% of it. If we get the A over 55, we've knocked out over 90%. So I think we can, we, can, we can get the schools open. That makes sense. We can get the economy open. That makes sense. And uh, that's going to make a difference. Even California and New York City have actually shown a little common sense lately. Andrew Cuomo, of all people, made this statement, we cannot, simp we cannot simply not stay closed until the vaccine hits critical mass. The cost is too high. And he said, we will have nothing left to open. Well, I mean, he should have thought about that a little earlier. I was watching uh, business news this morning and was looking at New York City. Every spring, I take students up to New York City uh, with a class I have, special topics and economics. We're up there and we're bumping elbows with people. We have to work to try to keep our little group together. The crowd is so big. And I looked this morning, there may have been one person walking on this side of the street in the block, maybe one person walking on this side of the street and way up there, you could see somebody going across the crosswalk. It's a disaster. And uh, New York City has really hammered itself. And it's, it's just not the way you want to do that. We will have nothing left to open. And I'm glad he finally realized that. A national shutdown is not an option in our future. We cannot do this again. You'd run the debt up, up, up through the, the roof. We just can't do it again. We've got to get and keep our schools open. Cost of not doing so is just too high. Of course, we have our schools open here in Arkansas. Wise move by our governor. Let me share this with you. And it's, it's a, this is an economic theme. No society can prosper if production is not the primary theme that runs through society and economy. No society can prosper if production is not the primary theme that runs through society and economy. We have to produce. The reason people are, uh, incomes are not what they, they would like them to be because they're not productive enough. Production is the key. Where's Arkansas? Let's talk about that for a minute. I'd say all things considered, <clears throat> all things considered, we're doing very well. Why are we doing so well? We didn't lock down. Governor Hutchinson did not go that route. He let most of the economic activity, and our mayors did the same thing. He let most ac economic activity proceed, construction, manufacturing, other activities. The governor asked us to use common sense, and we did that. During the pandemic, our unemployment was three to four percentage points below the national average. The reason we continue to go and to do. I, I see if you look out at your city streets, you see people, it's not like New York City, you see people coming and going and moving and business activity. If you look at our state revenue, personal income tax is up, sales tax is up, corporate tax is up, everything has been up. And that's a great measure of how our economy is doing, it's doing well. The mayor and governor in New York City have basically destroyed their economy up there. It's going to take years if they ever get back to where they were. New Jersey estimates they're going to have a $9.2 trillion deficit for 2021. We're running a surplus here in Arkansas. We ended up, we, have, we revised our budget now, but we ended up with a $360 million budget surplus in the year ending June, July, June 30th, beginning July the 1st. $360 million surplus. Today, in the new fiscal year, we are $257.6 million ahead. We're running a nice surplus. The state budget cuts that we did this spring got restored. 
the governor was able to put them back in. I couldn't believe it, but many Arkansas cities have seen an increase in sales tax revenue. Sales tax revenue has actually gone up. And I was asking the question, how could that be with restaurants uh, at less than full capacity and all that? I said, well, internet sales have been a huge part of it. And Arkansas, unlike a few years ago, we're now getting our share of the internet sales. Tremendous. So you remember in the third quarter of last year, we went down 33%. Then we came up about the same amount. I think this fourth quarter of this year will probably have somewhere between three and 6% growth. I can see out to 2021, this year is gonna be good. We could have 5% growth this year. Of course, we're coming back from a, an economic calamity, but we could have a 5% growth. U.S. unemployment's gonna be near 5% by the end of the year, be 2022 before we get full recovery. The reason I don't wanna go out too far into 2022 is we've got to wait to see what the new administration is gonna do. What is their fiscal policy gonna do? You have to be careful about things like minimum wages and increasing corporate taxes and uh, putting on a higher capital gains tax, which is really a capital transaction tax, by the way. If you read my book, you'll find out about that. So you have to be careful. So I don't want to go out much past into 2022 because we'll have to be careful. We need you need you need progressive uh, pro-production economic policy. It's very important. Now, what's this mean for you and me? Well. The online world just got a lot bigger. I've ordered more stuff online this year than I have in my any, any time before that. It's tremendous. It's part of our lifestyle now. You think about, well, I'll just, I just pull up my little iPhone here. I'll, it's already got me on Amazon. I'll just punch a button and I've got it and it'll be here a day or two. Cities have lost their luster, particularly the really big ones. People are fleeing like gangbusters. They're also leaving places like California with the high state taxes. Uh, state income taxes, with the high property taxes, with the high real estate prices. They're leaving because you increase your standard of living by doing that. Some are coming to Arkansas, by the way. We are not being left out. I, I was in uh, Little Rock for a procedure a few months ago, and I was talking to this nice young lady who was a nurse taking care of me. And I said, uh, well, where are you from? Just strike up conversation. She said, well, I'm from Connecticut, but my husband and I were working in New York City. And I said, well, what brought you to Arkansas? She said, the cost of living. The cost of living brought us to Arkansas. And so we're benefiting. Our cost of living down here is less than half of what it is in New York City if you factor in real estate prices. Some states, California, New Jersey, New York, and others seemed absolutely determined to destroy their economies during this pandemic. Finally, service and convenience are gonna become much more important for particularly retail businesses and all businesses. People want service, they want convenience, and they want it done quick. Now, I'm a little concerned about the direction, I'm gonna change topics a little bit, I'm a little bit concerned about the direction the US is heading in terms of our philosophy and economy. Socialism is fundamentally at odds with freedom. Serious, it, it seriously is. It's fundamentally at odds with freedom. And I, how can we expect capitalism to survive if so many Americans particularly American students, don't even know what it is. And so they're quick to, to sign up for socialism. In 1991, I had an opportunity to take a trip with a group of college administrators and faculty members here in Arkansas to go to the Soviet Union. This was just as the Soviet Union was breaking up and Russia was getting ready to be formed. The USSR actually, we were in November, actually later that year in December, the USSR ceased to exist. And people were actually, I couldn't believe it, they were actually marching in the streets way with the tricolor Russian flag and nobody got shot. So you could see this was coming. And we were on a bus in St. Petersburg and formerly Leningrad, by the way, they changed it back to St. Petersburg, driving along the Neva River. The tour guide, perhaps feeling a little safe during a time of, of uh, the, the fever for freedom that was going along, she pointed out a vintage warship moored on the other side of the river. She said that the Russians considered that vintage warship the most destructive warship in the Russian Navy. She said, that's because that ship fired the blank shot in 1917 to signal the beginning of the Russian Revolution. She paused a minute. She said, just think of it, paused again. One blank shot 
followed by 74 years of destruction. And of course, she was talking about communism. And she was right. There were actually some Americans during the Great Depression that thought we ought to go to communism, that capitalism had failed, and that's the direction we want to go. We need to remind our fellow citizens that socialism is somewhere between capitalism and communism. Socialism tends to promote the power of government. Capitalism seeks to promote the power of the individual. And that makes a huge difference. I study economics, but I also study aviation as a general aviation pilot. The principle employed to fly safely is relevant to the principles of economics. Here's my little instrument panel up here. By the way, I, I earned my private pilot's license uh, up at Fayetteville University of Arkansas. And on my check ride, my uh, FAA examiner, we took off from Fayetteville, Drake Field, and he told me, so I want you to fly to uh, Rogers. That time, I think the field was only 2,500 feet long, which is not that long. And uh, he said, I want you to land on, do a short field landing when you land down there. And so I landed and I was thinking, I was a little exuberant. I hit the brakes a little too hard. And he said, whoa, 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 not so hard on the brakes. But at any rate, I passed it. And that was my first visit to uh, Rogers Airport. And of course, things are different now. It's, 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 it's more up, up speed than it, upgrade than it was there. But there, up on the left there, you can see the airspeed indicator on the ground, so it shows zero. In the middle is, is not, by the way, you have to be fast enough in an airplane, in my airplane, so that you don't fall out of the sky if you get too slow. Get too fast, you rip the wings off. The middle one is the attitude indicator. That shows the configuration of the wings, and that's particularly important on takeoffs and landings. The altitude indicator is on the far right and reading about 440 feet. And you've got to be high enough so that you don't hit the ground or anything attached to the ground. And of course, there's the fuel gauge. You've got to have fuel. In fact, uh, aviators always joke the only time you can have too much fuel is when you're on fire. And uh, that's, that doesn't happen that often. But let me tell you, it, it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat, a Republican, an independent, a member of the Green Party, or just don't care, if you get in the cockpit of that aircraft, you had better pay attention to those in instruments. It doesn't matter what your political background is or what your ideology is. You have to pay attention to those instruments. Well, there are principles of capitalism just the same that are ignored only to the detriment of the economy and its citizens, just like has been done during this pandemic when you ignore the reality of needing to produce things. Private property is key. Private property is used more productively than public property. Competition is wonderful. Competition makes prices lower and quality higher. And I, I would think, I know the quality of American automobiles is higher now because of imported automobiles. It keeps your feet to the fire. Supply and demand should set prices, not government. By the way, this is why the minimum wage should be set by, the wages should be set by supply and demand so that a, an 18 year old kid with poor communication skills doesn't get priced out of the market because of the minimum wage. We want these kids to work. And by the way, people who have businesses and farms, they can get their kids to work. It's the kid that doesn't have that opportunity, may come from a dysfunctional family, would love to have a job, but we price them out of the market. Let's not do that. The role of profit, profit is a good thing. This what goes to the guy or gal who stays up half the night trying to figure out how to keep their business alive and add another product. Finally, a limited role for government in the economy. Key, we must keep that limited. I, in fact, I taught for many years here at Southern Arkansas and I created this book basically out of, out of all these years of teaching. I'm concerned that we're moving away from the economic principles that created this economic powerhouse. I mean, right now we're number one in military power and economic power. We may not stay that way. Do you know that China is actually moving away from communism, moving more toward the marketplace? They'll never get to the, to the marketplace we have with democracy. It's, it's probably a little bit more like fascism than it is communism, but they're moving where they're going to use the free market to move their economy ahead. And I think we're going to have some real competition. We need to rediscover the American dream that we're the land of opportunity if we don't ruin it with socialism. The bigger the government, the more inefficient it is, the more clumsy it is, 
and it tends to trample, trample on people's freedoms. I've had a number of adults read this book, like it, and then buy them for their kids because we're concerned. You know, surveys indicate half of the young people in the United States think socialism is the way to go. Well, socialism means big government, it means control, and it's not what we need. This idea must change or our, eco our economic future is gonna be a little mediocre. Now, I'd love to send you, I'm, I'm really on a crusade here for people to understand these principles, and I'll send you an autographed copy of this. If you go to David F. Rankin, put that F in there, davidfrankin.com and go to buy a book and uh, I will send it, autograph it and send it to you. If you want a particular person's name in it or something like that, I'll be glad to do that. You can get it on Amazon too, it just won't be autographed. Final comment, you can crash an economy by violating the principles of flight. You can crash a market economy like ours by violating the principles of capitalism. For the faith, really the, the few, for the future of generations of Americans to come, let's not do that. Hey, I've enjoyed the visit and uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd love to, love to visit with you. I'm sure somebody's got some questions. I think you've probably overwhelmed us with your wisdom and <laughs> information. The, the, the statistics were encouraging. Does anybody have any questions you wanna bring up? Well, if not, we will wrap this up. Um, I do want to thank you so much um, for providing this program. And Dr. Rankin, I'm going to go to your website and see about getting one of your books. It's been a long time since I got a minor in economics. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's not an economics textbook. It's an easy read. I hope you enjoy it. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. And um, again, these the statistics do sound really encouraging. And I think everyone who's participating is probably pleased to know that you project 2021 is going to be a very good year. Uh, um, I, I wish we could hold you to that. And I hope you're right. <laughs> I hope I'm right too. So uh, we do want to thank you, Dr. Rankin. And we want to thank Dr. Beth Ann Rankin with Rankin Consulting for providing this presentation and helping us plan for the future. Um, this is a great way for businesses to think about how to navigate through the economic challenges and the economic opportunities that we have before us. Um, and again, we want to thank our community builder sponsor, Black Hills Energy, and our printing sponsor, Printova Signs and Graphics. And once we have this recording uploaded to the Chamber to Community Back to Business um, channel on YouTube, I will send you a link. I will also send you Dr. Rankin's slides, and um, that way you can refer back to it or you can share with friends. And we do want to encourage you to take a look at all of our C2C workshops. And if you have an idea for a workshop, just give us a call or shoot me an email and let us know what your thoughts are. Maybe you've got a program you'd like to present, or maybe you know another speaker that has something that would be valuable to our chamber members. So I want to thank everyone for joining us, and we hope you have a great rest of your week. Bye, y'all. <laughs>